Recording is on. All right, so we are all gathered here uh, to uh, this is the Bitcoin design community, and we're here at a Thunder Biscuits uh, Lightning, uh, Mastering the Lightning Network uh, reading group, and uh, we're going to discuss, uh, finish discussing chapter three, uh, how the Lightning Network works. Um, and uh, just to uh, ask again, everybody can see my screen share okay before I start kick us off. Um, just to kind of remind everybody, uh, Thunder Biscuit has this nice uh, page set up kind of with a schedule and some kind of consolidated um, information about it. Uh, so uh, the meeting notes will be uh, linked to here. These are uh, GitHub issues and the uh, Bitcoin design meta repository. Uh, we post YouTube Bitcoin TV links afterwards. And um, I just wanted to check. I know last week we had kind of solicited some questions in advance in a uh, Google Drive document. Was there uh, anything like that this week? I've been a little bit not paying attention to Slack as thoroughly as I should have this week. I don't think so, no. Okay. Well, if anybody does have any questions, um, you know, if uh, just uh, paste them in the chat if you like, um, or just uh, you know, interrupt me just to, to give you an idea of a flow for um, anyone who, who wasn't here last week. Uh, I just been kind of, you know, have some little presentation here with just some notes from chapter three. And we're kind of at the end of, of discussing channels, um, like particular, or I'm sorry, particularly um, discussing like uh, the, the types of transactions uh, that are used uh, in order to, to work with channels. Um, so about to talk about closing channels real quick, just kind of the different ways you can close channels. Then after that, I'm gonna move on to talking about uh, invoices. And then after that, move on to the, the, the general topic of payments, how they're routed through the network, how you find a path, the act of pathfinding, all of that good stuff. So, uh, you know, this is a group discussion and I'm just kind of like leading us through the content. So feel free, free to interrupt with any questions you have along the way. Um, all I ask is just try to keep the question, you know, kind of on topic to what we're, we're, we're discussing at the current moment. And then uh, at about one, well, at a, about 33 minutes from now, um, at 1.45 my time, we're going to uh, stop the recording and just kind of open it up for a uh, general Q&A, any kind of lightning questions you, you want to have, just kind of free, free discussion about the chapter or the book or the lightning network in, in general after that. Um, so does anybody have uh, any questions before we begin? All right, well, I'm gonna dive right into it. So this is kind of where we left off last time and we just kind of talked about basically ways that punishment transactions could be used to prevent a channel partner from cheating with prior state. And that kind of leads us into our next topic, which is about closing channels. And you know, one, one, one interesting point I thought the authors brought up is that closing channels is kind of optional if you think about it. You could really keep a channel open uh, indefinitely if you wanted to, um, you know, provided that you had enough uh, Bitcoin in your Lightning channels and you had enough well-connected channels and you kept your challenges, you know, kept the liquidity balanced, you could theoretically keep them open uh, as long as you wanted to, um, if as long as your channel partners were willing um, and you would be able to spend all that Bitcoin on the Lightning Network. So that's an option. Um, but, you know, there, there's going to be situations where you're probably going to have, you know, that that's in theory, but in practice, you're probably going to have to close your channels from time to time. Um, and so like a mutual close, as they describe it, is the, uh, the good way. Um, it's the fastest way to close a channel. And uh, basically, it's uh, each of the two lightning nodes uh, kind of communicate with each other over the lightning protocol. They decide that they want to close the channel together. And so they're able to close it a lot quicker. Um, there's no like, uh, you know, money locked up um, in these, you know, revocation schemes or anything like that. And uh, whoever opened the channel, whoever like deposited um, their money to form the channel in the first place, they're the ones who pays the on-chain fees uh, with the miner when, when the, the uh, closing transaction gets mined. Then you have a forced close, which is the bad way. And that's basically say one channel partner, their node goes offline or that node decides to be uncooperative and um, they, uh, they decide that they don't wanna close it. Um, so 
and the reason that they say this is the bad way is because the partner who who initiates the force close say that the one that's that's still online, uh, they 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 have kind of a slight disadvantage here, and that's because the the uncooperative node or the offline node, their funds are actually spendable immediately, and the person who's initiating the close is time locked. And this might seem a little backwards at first. Why is the uncooperative person or the offline node? Why do they have an advantage? But the reason is because you want the other partner, the one who's not consenting to having the channel closed, you want them to have time to dispute the transaction, and this is where the punishment transaction could come in, they could use the revocation secret. So let's say someone tried to close the channel with you without your consent, that might be them trying to steal like steal your money by using a prior transaction. So that would give you time to use the punishment transaction and the revocation secret to make sure that you don't lose your money. And, uh, you know, I, I think that I'm, I'm, this is a little something I'm kind of wrap my head around, but the force close actually has a, a higher on-chain fees. Um, and I, I think that it has something to do with the, the way they describe it is that basically there could be pending transactions that you were routing um, at the time uh, that the force close happens. And so there would need to be a way to uh, include uh, transaction fees to close out on chain for those transactions as well. So essentially the idea is that the these punishment transactions include higher on chain fees um, in case it needed to be closed out. I might have butchered that and said that a little wrong. So if anybody wants to say that better or has a better understanding of that, please chime in and, and let me know. Uh, I just want to add like uh, one more detail that can be added here. That is this extra transactions are coming from the HTLCs. So uh, imagine like you have a state of a channel where you have like forwarded some HTLCs, but which, ha which hasn't yet settled in a co new commitment transaction. So, but your partner got like uh, shut down or something, it's unresponsive and you have to settle that state. So that state, that transaction that you will put in the blockchain will have many outputs one, uh, among them one output will be the commitment output and other outputs will be HTLC outputs and HTLC outputs can be spent like you can get back the funds of the HTLC outputs but then you have to spend them again so there are a lot for each extra output that includes each extra transaction so that's a very long way to get back the funds than the good way. In the good way, you have just only one commitment transaction. And in the bad way, you have one commitment transaction plus an HTLC transaction, which hasn't been settled. So that's why the transaction fee increases. And when you said that there was multiple HTLCs there, were you meaning to say that like, um, uh, that, that would be like, uh, it, it's just, that's just natively how it works? Or is that because of, it might include routing attempts from other nodes? Yeah, it, 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 uh, because of the reason that it might include those right routing attempts. So each unsettled HTLC is a routing attempt. And as far as I understand, yeah, that's what it means. And, and, uh, and, and they would be payable to different nodes, those UTXOs. Yes. So the, the uh, HTLC UTXO has this condition, like it can be paid back to you if you have the payment hash. That means that the transit the payment has been successful so you have got the pre-image of the payment hash now you can spend back to yourself like you can acquire that utxo or there is a time lock that the other node who is offline right now he can get back this transaction after a timeout. So obviously you will spend that transaction right away because assuming that you have those HTLCs, that means that the routing attempt had succeeded. So you have the payment pre-image with that you will like immediately take back those HTLCs to your account. Gotcha, thank you. I think uh, I think I think I heard someone else it sounded like they were about to start a comment before I started speaking last. I don't know, it wasn't me, but I, I, I did want to just mention, Raj, that's a great explanation. That was something that was unclear to me was what actually happens to make some outputs uh, immediately usable and then some outputs not. I mean, it, I guess the, the key here is that what gets delayed is your ability to spend a specific output. So 
your 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 penalty transaction commits to the blockchain and the person who did the penalty transaction their outputs are time locked while the other party's outputs are not time locked so i make does that seem right so a little catch here that is there are two kind of locks in action one is the lock that is in htlc and another is in the lock that they called uh, R, uh, rsmc contract which is basically the commitment contract that the other party has so that has a lock and also each individual htlc is also has a lock so those two kinds of locks have to satisfy uh, themselves and i think the commitment transaction is locked to yourself and the htlc transaction is locked to the other party so in the case of commitment transaction it's you who have to wait to get back the transaction so that's why in the bad way you have to wait and the other party has the immediate advantage of getting back the transaction but the other party is offline so he will not do that or that's why you are closing it otherwise it will be a breach and uh, but in the htlc is the other party has to wait that also again depends on the kind of htlc so there are two kind of htlc that is like htlc going from your end to the other party end and the htlc that are coming from other party to your end so depending on those two cat categories the time locks will be symmetrically opposite to each other I see. So there's basically outputs in that transaction for not just stuff you're doing with your channel partner, but also uh, stuff that's routing through your channel. Yeah, yeah. That that that's a better way to put it. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, good, good, good information. So the other way that would be that they, uh, you could uh, close a channel would be the protocol breach, which they call the ugly way. And uh, see, this could be done after a cheating partner initiates a forced close with a previous commitment transaction. The other partner can publish a pun punishment transaction and collect the cheater's share of the funds without being encumbered by a time lock. Their partner can publish a punishment transaction and collect the cheater's share of the fund without being covered by a time lock. So, if the way I understand this is, and this is, you know, seemingly very, very um, uh, related to the previous one, you wouldn't have the protocol breach without a force close first being initiated. So, if I understand this one properly, essentially, this would be, you know, let's say Alice tries to initiate a force close with Bob uh, such that, so she can essentially reclaim her money. She wants to get that free coffee, let's say, and she tries to force close, initiate a force close um, to many, many prior states, maybe even all the way, all the way back to the, the beginning uh, of the, the payment history. And she would try to force close with the previous commitment transaction. So the protocol breach would essentially be Bob stepping in and saying, whoa, whoa, she's trying to publish a previous transaction. He would publish a punishment transaction, which would include the revocation secret that Alice had handed him previously. And he would collect not only his money that he was owed from her, but all of the money that she had initially locked in the channel as well. So for having been cheated on, Bob would essentially walk away with all the money that had been put in the channel, uh, if I understand that properly. Do we know how, how likely this is to happen accidentally? Like I know one of the, the constraints with, with Lightning is you need to keep, you need to, keep track of your channel state. So if Alice um, made a transaction and then her node crashed and she had it backed up. And so she like fired up her node again with old, an old version of her transaction history. Um, and then she tried to close. So she, she'd be publishing something that was wrong. So she'd be publishing, it, it would be a forced close that she'd be trying to do a protocol breach basically, right? So I guess she'd have to, not only have old state, but also try to do a forced close instead of like a, a mutual close to end up in this scenario? That's, that's a really good question. And the way I think about that is that like, let's say, you know, the scenario you said where her node, you know, you know, went off for a little bit and say she didn't have 
and then she tried to restore it from a backup. I mean, I think a couple of things. One, I don't really see how if her node went offline, I feel like her backup would still be completely up to date because if her node was offline, then nothing could have happened in that time that her node was offline. Like her node wouldn't have been able to route anything. So I think that um, her, her backup would have been totally and completely up to date once she brought the node back up online. Um, and, but then hypothetically, let's say that some error had happened and, uh, you know, I don't know, for whatever reason, her backup lost the most recent transaction that had occurred. Um, you know, it seems to me that, um, you know, again, Alice would try to at least try to initiate the, um, the, the good way, the, the mutual, the mutual close, um, so, I, I mean, I feel like if both lot nodes are online, they're, they're going to opt for the mutual close. But, I, I mean, it is a worrisome thing. You know, bugs do happen in software, and, and it's like, it's something to think about. You know, if, if somebody does, could somebody write a piece of code that, you know, accidentally tries to, you know, there's some bug that, you know, um, causes a, uh, a, you know, a, a forced close to happen or, or just a bug that causes... Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess it could happen is what I'm trying to say. Um, I don't know what the likelihood is, though. Does anybody else have any thoughts on that? Well, and just to, as far as I understand with the backups, like a common, obviously very popular right now is Umbral, and you have to manually back up. So you, it's very seems very possible that your channels could end up in a state that's newer than your newest backup. Okay, that's fair. I see what you're saying now. That makes yeah, sense. Also, yeah, that plus like you, you you kind of said it already, but um, the case that I would be worried about, or I guess that people worry about, uh, is that when you're doing the the state update, that's when it fails to save the backup. Like as the new as you route a new payment, or as you you know make a payment, uh, pay an invoice over the channel, and like it's it's that it's that backup that fails and you crash. Uh, then is when you've lost that state of that last payment. And that's really the case where you could end up um, unable to recover. And so I do wonder though, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know the answer to this and this would be interesting to find out from some of the teams, but like when you first turn back on your node after, I don't know, either manually turning it off or some kind of crash situation, does it try to like, check with the with your channel partner and say like hey like i'm back did i you know this is what i think is the most recent state am i right and like can they can they recover from that where they say like oh here's my here's the revocation secret that you might have missed uh for these old transaction and here's the latest state like i don't know if they do that or they're just like oh we disagree let's close and you know it's a mess it's unclear it's unclear if they do that kind of like recovery process I think it, it does that and probably a right, nice way and quick way to check that is like you, you can you can stop your LND instance and start it and see the communication thing that the communication that is happening and I, I don't exactly remember but somewhere in the code I think I have seen somewhere like uh, uh, after a restart the nose tries to do some kind of like talking with its peers to sync up the channel state again and uh, uh, and and at that point when the node doesn't find it like it knew about some peer but now the peer is not answering anymore so the node will then try to attempt the force close way but yeah i'm st i'm also not sure like how how frequent this protocol breaches because you should like uh, the node has every incentive not to do a protocol breach because if somebody does a protocol breach he loses all his money unless he is very sure that the other node is not watching right now so uh, probably it's not a very uh, frequent thing in the chain but yeah i would also love to know and and what uh, raj was just talking about uh leads us very very uh cleanly into the next topic here which is how you catch a protocol breach um and uh i know this is some stuff we've talked about a little bit on other calls but there's basically three ways you could do that you know one way you can run a lightning node 24 7. you can run a watchtower essentially run your own watchtower um or you could use a third-party watchtower you know assuming assuming that you trust the watchtower um so that that's basically it um if if anybody has any uh, discussion around uh, watchtowers or you know the implications of running a node um 24 7. uh 
happy to discuss that now. Otherwise, we can dive into building invoices. I, I have a question, actually. It's, I'm wondering, Raj, you were saying that the nodes, uh, if it's been unresponsive and you, 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 know, you fire your node again, it'll attempt to reconnect those channels and catch up or make sure. Does that imply you could lose your state and maybe ask the, your your peer to give it back to you? Is that um, is that possible? Like, if, say you lose you lose your backup, right? This I feel like that's a common thing. You lose your backup, then what happens then? Do you the, the other node doesn't even know that you've lost your backup? So then um, eventually it just gets tired of it and it just force closes, or or do you have a way to, to and and it doesn't even know if you might anyway. Just wondering. What happens then? Yeah, that's a great question. I think what happens is like uh, each node needs to maintain inside their backup certain kind of secrets that the other node doesn't have. So there are always these kind of like uh, base points that they say, and that these are like derived public keys that used in lots of construction of those internal uh, transactions of a channel state. So if you lose your backup, you probably don't have those secrets anymore, and those secrets cannot be you cannot fetch them back from the other node because the other node doesn't know about it. I'm unclear as to how then that that makes sense. But then I wonder how uh, how those get closed. Basically, it's just a matter of waiting until the other party realizes that you're not uh, you're not responsive or that you don't have your your channel state anymore, and that they can. At this point, they should take all the funds because you can't recover them anyway. So, or or is there? I don't know. I assume there's no way. Once you've lost your backup, there's probably no way to do the good uh, settlement, where like you could recover part of your fund, even if your if your counterparty was actually uh, sort of like trying to help you out. Could they even help you out to, so that the funds get divided up properly, or is it not even feasible if you don't have your backup? then they might as well take all the funds because the rest of them are lost or uh, no yeah. i don't think like they can take all the funds because what they will have is the latest state of the commitment transaction and that commitment transaction already includes the uh, division of shares between the multi sig addresses so uh, that will always have your share into it so all they can do is like uh, they cannot punish you because you haven't put any commitment transaction or you haven't trying to breach it all they can do is force close on you so if you lose your backup you just have to wait until the other party force closes you and you get back your bitcoin uh, your share into a bitcoin address and other party gets back theirs uh, well, the one interesting question comes here, like, then who pays the fee? And I'm not exactly sure, but that's something I'd like to find out. Thanks for the question, though. I think his point was, though, they could pro they could breach it and um, replay a version, a state where they had all the money or something like that. And you couldn't you couldn't do the punishment transaction because you lost your backup. And, and I, and I guess, think yeah, the that's another good point. The, the thing that would hold them back from that is not anything that you could do, but just the the the, the idea that maybe you're faking not having. Yeah, they <laughs> yeah maybe. Know. Yeah, that's they cool. No way of knowing. Yeah. So so game theoretically, it's not perfect for them. That's interesting. Yeah, I wonder. Yeah. They I wonder if they could like do some kind of test payment to you and and to prove that you you don't have it or something. Um, I don't know. It'd be interesting. Because you can well, go actually, around you don't have the latest. Saying, "Oh, I don't have like, you know, do do your thing," and then they would like, and then you steal all the funds. Yeah, but even if they don't have the latest state, as long as they have the secret for the older state, you try to replay. That's all you need. You don't need the latest one, right? Yeah, it just depends so you, on what they lost. If they lost everything, then there's probably nothing they can do. But yeah. right, that's true. But they don't. Yeah, they don't know how much you lost. I guess. <laughs> All right, I'm going to uh, move on to the topic of uh, invoices, uh, if, if everybody's ready to talk about that. Um, and, uh, you know, I want to go ahead and I'm going to try and uh, breeze through the kind of remaining topics here just so that we can, um, you know, make sure that we uh, get to everybody's questions about um, both of these topics here. Let me see how much uh, further we have to go. So. Uh, 
invoice. That's essentially where a uh, lightning payment begins. Bob prompts Alice for payment by sending her a lightning invoice. Um, there is uh, something called a key send uh, that essentially would allow you to send a lightning payment without an invoice. Um, but I don't think we should talk about that too much today because they say it's going to be covered in uh, later chapters of the book. Um, uh, so it's a little outside the scope of this chapter, but that's something cool to look forward to for, uh, for future chapters. That would be somewhat analogous to maybe sending to a Bitcoin address on their one, but um, I don't understand it yet and I won't, I won't, I won't pretend to. Um, but basically your, your lightning invoice, it includes a, a payment hash, a recipient, an amount, and then an optional text descri description. Um, the payment hash, a lot of times, I, I know in lightning discussions, some people have been using the word pre-image. Um, you know, essentially the pre-image is a random number that's used to uh, as an input to the hash to create the payment hash. Um, so the pre-image is essentially just a random number. So I've, I've heard some people kind of use those those terms interchangeably, but but technically they're they're different things. Um, this is kind of an example of of an invoice. Um, we, uh, you know, this, you, if you have a lightning wallet, you've probably seen something like this. This is the QR code. And I didn't want to show the, the whole image because it's tall, but it's a Betch 32 encoded string. So this is kind of like from a data perspective, what the, the, the invoice looks like down here. Um, but then it gets presented as a QR code so that you can easily, you know, scan it from your phone or something like that. Um, so invoices to me seem seem fairly straightforward. Um, but does uh, does anybody have any questions or discussion points about about invoices before we move on to delivering a payment? Because man, delivering a payment is like really probably going to be a lot of meaty discussion. But did anybody want to talk linger on invoices for a little bit? I just my one comment was they made a, a strong point there, which is interesting for like a design perspective that these happen out of band that you know, like you show the QR code here that unlike a lot of the rest, basically the rest of the entire rest of the protocol, this is the one part that you have to go find some other way to send your invoice, right? Yeah, that, that is very interesting. So it, it opens up a lot of different possibilities, I guess. So that's, that's interesting. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting that, like the, the one thing that the Lightning Network doesn't do is send invoices, um, which, which it makes sense. But. Yeah, and they do bring up the point that that's equivalent to Bitcoin, where you do have to somehow out of band give somebody your Bitcoin address if you want them to pay you. It's a somewhat equivalent concept, but yeah, it makes um, sense. Much more information involved. So yeah, interesting. All right, let's dive into uh, delivering a payment. This is, uh, you know, just and in, and in, in, you know, talking with other people about the the Lightning Network. I think this is um, one of the more complicated, you know, areas that tends to spark a lot of discussion. Um, so one kind of key point about Lightning payments is that they are atomic. Uh, so in computer science principles, that means that there's no metal state. Uh, they either they either succeed or they fail. Um, so the Lightning Network has what we call a P2P gossip protocol, um, basically peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, and basically, the way they talk about it in the book, uh, you have your Lightning node set up, and each node, your, your node is going to connect to a random selection of other nodes in the network. Um, each node in the network is going to do this. And so these other nodes, these random selection of other nodes that your nodes connect to are called your peers. Um, and this, I mean, the, the gossip protocol, the way I understand it is just that, you know, that's the way that the, the nodes kind of uh, talk to each other, send information to each other, uh, let each other know who has what channel. Uh, so essentially when Alice and Bob form their channel together and they become channel partners, they can choose to have uh, their, their channel be announced or unannounced. So if, if, if they, uh, you know, didn't announce their channel, then they would be able to route payments directly through each other, but they wouldn't be able to, um, other people wouldn't necessarily be able to route payments through them unless uh, those people, you know, knew in advance about their channel. Um, 
so the gossip protocol, that P2P gossip protocol, you know, once it, it, you know, you have these announced channels, it can share that information with each other, but it only shares a little bit of the information. One of these reasons is to protect privacy. Uh, another reason is to scale the amount of payments. And another reason is that the information is outdated by the time it is received. And that's one thing that I kind of thought was interesting because we, we, you know, We've, we've talked a little bit before about um, like lightning explorers, like 1ML and, and sites like that. And uh, there you could go on there and you can see, you know, different different lightning nodes and, you know, what, what size channels they have and all that kind of thing. Um, but the thing we have to remember is that those channels are... Uh, that or th those types of explorers are, are significantly different than a block explorer, um, significantly different than say blockchain.info, significantly different than mempool.space. Um, the, the the Lightning Explorer, like it's not bad information necessarily, but it's just that with the Lightning Network and the P2P protocol, that there there's only so much amount of accuracy you can have at any one given time because the network is changing so frequently that the information is is kind of always outdated. Um, and just in terms of like routing a payment. Um, this is a little graphic that I whipped up real quickly. This was just an idea of like, you know, if Alice wanted to send uh, to Gabe, um, this is how she could do it. We've kind of been using an example, uh, you know, so far of Alice sending payments to Bob, but the idea is she could also, if Bob had a channel to Charlie and, uh, you know, Charlie had one to this person that I forgot to put a name next to, um, and that person had a channel to Gabe, then she could easily route a payment um, through those different channels, provided that there was enough liquidity there. So this is um, a point that I think is is fairly important um, because this is, you know, again, kind of kind of like um, uh, when I was talking about pre-image and payment hash, these are, I think, terms that I hear people kind of use synonymously, but they're all different things. So payments are forwarded along a path made of multiple channels. Pathfinding is the process of finding a path from source to destination. Routing is using the path to make a payment, right? So this yellow line here would signify the path. Alice to Bob to Charlie to Null to Gabe. That is That line there is the path. Pathfinding is the act of figuring out what this path is. You know, she could have gone to Dana, to Charlie, to Null, to Gabe, or, you know, to Frank, to Null, to Gabe, right? So the act of figuring out which one of these to use is pathfinding. And then routing would actually be taking that payment and sending the payment along the path to its destination. So path, figuring it out as pathfinding, sending the payment is routing. So they're three different things, but they're all related. Um, Source-based pathfinding. So basically, the way they say it, if we knew the exact channel balances of every channel, we could easily compute a payment path using any of the standard pathfinding algorithms taught in any computer science class. Uh, with only partial information about the network top topology, pathfinding is a real challenge, and active research is still being conducted into this part of the Lightning Network. The fact that pathfinding problem is not fully solved in the Lightning Network is a major point of criticism towards the technology. Which I thought that was an interesting point, which is why I want to include it, because usually when I hear people kind of criticize on the Lightning Network and talk of reasons why um, it might not be a good idea, is, is, is usually just the idea of does it does it lend itself towards centralization? Does it lend itself like towards centralization of, you know, channel partners who have the highest amount of liquidity? Um, but there, there, I thought this was an interesting criticism that the idea that the pathfinding is, is actually very difficult. And I guess the idea is that if I can try to say this in my own words, is that like, if you knew every single node on the network and you knew every single channel, channel balance of every node on the network, then, figuring out the optimal path to route your money through would be a totally easy problem to solve because there's so many computer science algorithms to solve these kind of problems. Like with Google Maps, it's like we basically know every road in existence, um, you know, and, and, you know, a lot of nations, and we already have maps of all these things. So have you, if you assume the data is perfect, you could just run it through an existing algorithm to come up with the optimal route from your house to your friend's house. But 
The fact is, is that we don't have an accurate map of the Lightning Network. The P2P gossip protocol doesn't share full network topology. It's constantly changing. It's constantly being updated. So it's actually an incredibly difficult computer science problem. How do you find the optimal path when you don't have perfect information about the potential paths that might be available to you? Just to add a little subtlety to that, um, it, it is actually like a, a known hard problem, even if you do have perfect knowledge, to find the optimal path. But, okay. but, but like you're saying, there are a ton of really good computer algorithms for finding very good paths when you have perfect information. Okay, so thank you for bringing up that subtlety. Yeah, so if I can say to make sure I understand. So basically what they're trying to say is that not that there are perfect pathfinding algorithms and computer science that we you would use with perfect information just that there's reliably fairly good ones that you can fall back to right yeah okay got it i think it's also worth mentioning that you know routing not necessarily source routing but just you know network routing like this has been done on the internet for a few decades now so even if people complain that it's not perfect there's obviously good enough solutions out there that has been working for a for a while now, <laughs> similar technology, you know, similar algorithms, I'm sure, in play. Yeah, I guess that that makes sense. I mean, there's not like, uh, I mean, I, I, you know, I certainly don't have a computer science degree, and so you know, I've kind of, um, you know, street level networking knowledge. But I mean, is it even possible for like a single computer on the internet to have? like a full map of the internet and, and everything that's that's on it? No, I mean, the, the way the way it works is, I mean, it's sort of hierarchical in a way, the internet, you know, there's these kind of top level, you know, top level routers that have maps to different sort of sub parts of the internet. And it's all kind of hidden, you know, sort of the, all the details get hidden in the lower layer, layer, lower layer routers. I don't think as far as I know, lightning routing doesn't have that kind of hiding, but it does some, you know, it's doing something different in terms of just giving you a partial picture. Um, and the other thing about the internet is that the routes are always changing, just like in lightning, like there's always networks, entire subnets going on and off. And, you know, the tables all having to get updated. And, you know, there, that is a potential risk, I guess, is you don't want the routing to be so difficult that you do need these kind of high powered routers, like they, they do have on the internet, some very high powered dedicated routing machines, but um, you know, it's, 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 a definitely a solved problem from the algorithm point of view in terms of as the network grows, I guess that might be a concern that there might be too much, you know, it might be difficult. It might become difficult if you don't have some sort of hierarchy in the routes, but, um, yeah, that I don't, I don't know how that, how that plays out. Interesting. And, and thank you guys. I'm going to bring up these points when I do uh, this uh, same uh, uh, presentation to the uh, Atlanta folks later tonight. Um, I, always, I always love getting to do this twice because I get to, to learn more and share more. Um, now, this is uh, going to be kind of uh, uh, an interesting topic here, onion routing. Uh, and you, we've probably heard this, this term before. Because uh, I'm sure a lot of us are familiar, at least on a basic level, with Tor, the Onion Router. Um, so the the way I understand it is that this, uh, when we talk about Onion Routing on the the Lightning Network, it's a similar in concept. Um, it is an you know an Onion Routed protocol, but it's not the same as Tor as we know it. But it is it is similar in some regards. Uh, so basically, when you build an Onion on its route from payment. So basically from the payer to the payee, the onion is passed from one node to the next along a path. And then the payer constructs the entire onion from the center out. And uh, I really should have taken some time to like put together like an image to try and, and describe this. But essentially, first, the payer is going to create the payment information for the final recipient of the payment. And then they're going to encrypt that. And then they're going to encrypt that with a layer of encryption that only the, the recipient can decrypt. Then the pair is going to wrap that layer with instructions for the node and the path that immediately precedes the final recipient and encrypt it with a layer that only that node can decrypt. Um, so the way I think about that is, you know, it's essentially like you could route 
a payment through as many nodes as you needed to. And each node along that path is it is going to have, it's essentially like a message inside of a message, inside of a message, inside of a message. Each message is encrypted. So the first node you send it to has, so if you think about like an onion, each message is like a layer in the onion and each node along that path has essentially the ability to decrypt the outermost layer of the onion. So the first node decrypts the first layer of the onion, unwraps it, but they can't decrypt the second layer. So they send they send that to the next node in the path. That node can decrypt uh, essentially the next layer, and then that node can decrypt the next layer until it gets all the way until the very end. Um, uh, you know, you might think about that also as like a box inside of a box inside of a box inside, like, you know, a series of boxes, you know, this is getting very cartoonish, but a series of boxes with lot with padlocks on them. And, you know, each person that you're mailing it to essentially has um, a key to unlock the outermost box with an address that they're supposed to forward it to. And you know, they essentially unlock the box, send that to the next address, unlock the box, send that to the next address. Um, so that was probably a, a vast oversimplification of how an onion is built and and uh, pass, passed along. Um, does anybody want to tell me what I missed with building an onion or have any discussion points about that? Just, just another point of subtlety. It's, it, it's not as many hops as you want. I think there's a limit of tw uh, 20 layers. 20 layers. So does that mean that uh, you would essentially, the longest path you could have on the Lightning Network would be 20 layers? Correct. Uh, as far it. as I, I mean, that's what it says in the chapter. I, I, this was actually news to me, but that's what it says. Okay. <laughs> I, I actually have another interesting subtle point. I believe it was in this chapter too that the, so your box analogy works, except that at every hop, the box looks to be the same size. So after you encrypt, after you, after a node unwraps their layer of it, they then stick some random data in it so that it's the same size when they wrap it up again for the next node, something like that. I don't know exactly how that protocol works, but it's a privacy feature so that you don't ever know if you're the last hop or you're the first hop or what hop you are in the network in that chain. That is very interesting. Yeah, that uh, was... I just want to add, like, your box analogy works perfectly, and I don't remember, but there is a movie where they exactly do that with a mailing address. Like, you can literally create an onion routed mailing address, like physical mail, like gift wrapped box sent to your friends in such a way that it will be put to different addresses, and each address will open up the outer layer, check the next address to send, they will like speed post it or something like that. Yeah. But yeah, it, it does actually work. If, if, if we could figure out uh, what, what movie that is, I'll in, include a screenshot of it uh, so that in here so that it can kind of mirror the Better Call Saul screenshot I have from <laughs> earlier in the presentation. Yeah, I, I'll try to figure out what was the name of the movie and I'll let you know. Yeah. So I think we are about uh, nearing the end of this. I'm just going to go ahead and skip to the last one. And yeah, I think I got like two more here. So uh, basically about to open it up to free discussion about whatever here. Uh, Lightning Network can be thought of two networks. It's a network of nodes connected via the gossip protocol. So that's that's the, the P2P gossip protocol that we were talking about earlier. And then um, a network of partners with payment channels. So I thought that that was an interesting point to understand is that um, it's, it's, you know, the, the way in which uh, nodes on the network communicate with each other to announce that their channels are there, um, to announce their presence, things like that, is, uh, is different than how two channel partners would communicate with each other when they're routing payments back and forth. Um, so... Lightning messages, all communication between peers is sent via messages called lightning messages. These messages are all encrypted using a cryptographic communications network called the noise protocol framework. Um, so essentially that that would be the, the latter option there. That would be two channel partners sending each other lightning messages back and forth. And yeah, to be perfectly honest, getting into the noise protocol stuff, I feel like they didn't go into it too deep. Uh, 
in this chapter here, they kind of linked us to a website um, called the, new, the noise protocol.org um, where uh, we can learn more about that. Um, but that, that was, uh, uh, looked like it was getting a, a little deeper than I, you know, felt like I had time to talk about. Um, but uh, I think uh, now that I, I feel like kind of, I've kind of hit on every point in chapter three. So uh, I, I think I'd like to just kind of open it up to free discussion and um, questions now. Um, and uh, is there anything that anything I said wrong that anybody uh, feels like we need to correct before I turn the recording off? Okay, well, this has been good. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, turn the recording off and uh, we can uh, all continue to uh, chat and uh, hang out uh, hang out here uh, in this Jitsi channel uh, as long as we like. And hold on a second. Where's the stop recording button? Do 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 do. How do I use a computer?